All right. Uh, so good evening, uh, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening for our fall 2021 New Discoveries Lecture. Uh, my name is Minnie Wadwa, and I'm director of the School of Earth and Space Exploration, and it'll be my great pleasure to make the introductions to our speakers for tonight. Um, also, I just want to make note of the fact that uh, uh, helping out with some of the logistics here tonight are um, Kim Baptista, Meg Hufford, Alicia Hyatt, and Rick Alling from the School of Earth and Space Exploration. And I want to thank them each uh, for helping to make this uh, event possible. So um, the presentation tonight uh, for the fall edition of the new Discoveries Lecture is entitled The Universe Beyond Hubble. And so what you'll hear uh, is, is going to be very exciting um, new stuff about uh, the next, um, next generation of space exploration with the upcoming launch of the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, the lecture is basically part of a, a series of events that ASU is actually hosting as a community partner with NASA across the state of Arizona. Our goal is to encourage uh, broad participation in web-related events across Arizona. And so this event tonight is actually part of, um, as I mentioned, a series of events that will be taking place between now and December when the Web Telescope will launch. And so what we've done is we've created a web calendar of events, uh, which you can find on our school's website. And uh, K-12 students in particular are encouraged to go to our website and download uh, what we are calling a passport to the stars. And if you attend at least three NASA web events in Arizona, you'll be eligible to win some very cool prizes. So um, you can find the information about all of this on our website, uh, just Google CC ASU events, JWST and you, the web page will come up. And so hopefully you'll be able to navigate there and find all of this great information. So, you know, we're, we're super excited to be part of this James Webb Space Telescope community outreach team, along with uh, 15 other NASA selected hosts across the state. And uh, we're excited to be bringing you opportunities like tonight's lecture. So, um, tonight, you know, we'll learn about how uh, research in the coming years with the James Webb Space Telescope will complement Hubble's discoveries and will transform our view of the universe. And you'll learn about uh, the role that researchers and, and students here at ASU and the School of Earth and Space Exploration will play in this research and will push the knowledge uh, of the universe beyond anything that we ever imagined. And so uh, without much further ado, uh, let me briefly introduce you to our four speakers tonight. Professor Roger Windhorst, who is a Regents Professor in the School of Earth and Space Exploration, and he's co-investigator and interdisciplinary scientist for the James Webb Space Telescope. His research is in astronomy, cosmology, galaxy formation and evolution, the earliest epoch in the history of the universe, and astronomical instrumentation. And then Dr. Rolf Janssen is a research scientist in the School of Earth and Space Exploration, and his research focuses on ground and space-based ultraviolet to mid-infrared, broad and narrow band space photometry, and spectroscopy of nearby galaxies. Rosalia O'Brien is a second year astrophysics PhD student who's working with Professor Windhorst and Dr. Jansen, and she's interested in extragalactic astronomy and cosmology. Currently, she's studying the amount of light in our universe, as well as exploring future James Webb fields with the Hubble Space Telescope. And then finally, Liam Nolan is a senior undergraduate student majoring in physics and in earth and space exploration with concentration in astrophysics. He's part of uh, the Windhorse Cosmology Group, and his research is uh, focused on the study of faint radio galaxies. He's also working on analyzing the use of a deep field simulation program in the classroom. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Roger Windhorse, Dr. Jansen, Rosalia O'Brien, and Liam Nolan. So please take it away, Roger. Thank you very much, Minnie, and everybody for organizing this. It's a real privilege to be here. Um, so I won't say a whole lot more about myself other than I've been here for a long time, about three times 10 to the minus nine of the Hubble time. I'll leave it up to the web passport folks to figure out how many years that is. Um, but we're going to talk about um, the um, 
James Webb Space Telescope and also what comes after that. We need this young generation to my left and right to follow up on these telescopes, including Hubble. And that will be you, um, <laughs> Liam and Rosalia. Um, um, yeah, so we'll each take just a quick minute to yep. introduce ourselves as well. Uh, I'm Liam Nolan. Uh, as uh, many said, I'm a senior here uh, at ASU and CC. Um, majoring in astrophysics, physics, and minoring in French. I'm from Reston, Virginia, and uh, I've been with this group for a little under three years, uh, and I'm very excited to be here. Hi, uh, I'm a second year astrophysicist. Um, I'm working for both Rolf here and Roger, doing a bunch of extragalactic and cosmology work that I'm really excited about. Yeah, I'm excited to give some perspective from a graduate on, uh, I guess, why James Webb will be fun and exciting. Well, I'm uh, Rolf Jensen. I uh, was born and raised in the Netherlands uh, before I came to the US to ASU. And then I stuck here because there's so many exciting things that are going on that uh, I didn't want to leave. <laughs> I'm mostly interested in figuring out how the galaxies that we see in our local universe actually got to be. So in order to do that, to do that, we have to look far back in time and follow their evolution over time. And the James Webb Space Telescope is the next stage in that. Thank you, Rolf. Um, so we'll, we'll start with a, a brief synopsis of the Webb Telescope itself. And then uh, Liam and Rosalia and Rolf will each speak to the various science aspects and then we'll take some answering questions. Uh, Kim asked me specifically to have charts ready and, and I have a one hour talk. I didn't cut it, so you get the entire thing, but I'm not <laughs> gonna talk for an hour, trust me. Um, so full screen, if you look at the first chart, um, Hubble is to the left, and it actually was first thought of, conceived in 1946 by Lyman Spitzer, to use a German V2 rocket and bring a telescope into orbit. NASA didn't latch on until 1965, when they first started studying it, and it was first funded by Congress in 1973. It's still running today, 31 years um, after launch, and it's like NASA's Duracell bunny, or Energizer Bunny, and but they won't live forever. It's already between 12 and 16 years past its design lifetime. And so um, since 1996, we've been talking about and, and studying and conceiving and, and then fun, gotten funded by Congress and building the James Webb Space Telescope that officially started in 2002 when I joined the program and Wolf also around that time. Um, and that telescope will be launched in December, on December 18, if all is well, from Kourou in French Guiana. It's a NASA-European-Canadian collaboration. So we have a, a European launch vehicle. And maybe at the end, I'll have a few charts on the next generation telescopes here on the, on the right that were uh, conceived not too long ago, the giant Magellan telescope in the third panel. And then a much larger version of Webb, the so-called Atlast the uh, Advanced Technology Large Area Space Telescope. It looks just like Webb, but it's much bigger. That's on the drawing board. That will not happen until uh, Webb and Hubble are done, but um, that's for the future. So needless to say, I will skip some charts. Um, we're in this for the long haul, and yeah? this is half a human career or longer. You get wrinkled before you realize it. Now, Mr. Hubble, of course, was the astronomer that discovered the expansion of the universe. And Hubble the telescope was named after him. Left Mr. Webb next to JFK here to the right, uh, was the second NASA administrator that brought us to the moon, the moon landing to the Apollo program. And, and the telescope is named after him because he pushed NASA to actually develop a science program in, in NASA, which is why the astronauts on the moon took samples from. Everything else since then is history. So. Um, <clears throat> the web mirror is six and a half meters in diameter. It's bigger than the combined length of these tables compared to the human uh, size uh, Hubble mirror, which is slightly larger than um, a tall human. So web is two and a half times bigger than Hubble. That means at the same wavelength, 
it will have two and a half times better resolution. So it will have a, a small wavelength range of overlap. And then at much longer wavelengths, it will have the, the same resolution. So it's really an infrared telescope um, that is designed to see light as it is produced by objects that produce heat, such as uh, planets, forming exoplanets around nearby stars, cool stars, the ones that Rolf and others, Rosalia, are studying, star forming regions, and also very distant galaxies that contain hot stars, but these stars be so far away that due to the expansion of the universe, they're observed not at optical or ultraviolet wavelengths, but they're observed in infrared, which is why we need this large infrared telescope. Um, um, so Webb is large and it comes with a tennis court size, about the size of this room, um, sun shield that consists of Kapton. Kapton is like a glorified kitchen saran wrap that you use to uh, wrap up your leftover food, but it's very highly reflective and it has these five layers of um, um, sun shields that will reflect the sunlight. So the sun is always always underneath, um, you can see my cursor on this side of between the, the gyroscopes and reaction wheels always make sure that web is um, it's on the other side and the sun shield is. And that brings a temperature down from room temperature uh, to about 40, 45 degrees Kelvin. Now I brought a hollow, it's in my chest pocket here. Oops, it lost the solar panel, that's not a good sign. Um, and it goes around the earth every 96 minutes, 15 times a day. Um, since its launch, Hubble has had 172,500 sunrises and sunsets. So it's not a very stable platform. But Webb will have exactly one sunrise and one sunset in its 10 or so year lifetime that we hope for. The sunrise happens when the launch fairing gets thrown off and the sunset happens when the um, Sun shield is deployed automatically. In this cold, dark environment, which is four or five times further than the moon, we call it the L2 Lagrangian, you can see very faint objects. For scientists in the, in the uh, audience, it's about 31st magnitude on the astronomer's magnitude scale. Um, for everybody else, it's about the brightness of one firefly at a distance from the moon. Yeah, so imagine the firefly at the moon with the moon not there. That's how faint Webb can see, but it'll take about a day of exposure. So it will go up in this launch fairing of the Ariane rocket. It's on its way to uh, French Guiana right now. And then <clears throat> about 10 minutes after launch, the fairing will open up and they have the sunrise. And this big folded up package of uh, technology will deploy in space during the next 30 days with a lot of moving parts, a lot of redundant motors that deploy it, as you will see. And <clears throat> so when it gets into space from the Earth, it will leave in this spider web shaped uh, gravitational landscape. It goes with the Earth and the moon that goes around the Earth, around the sun every 365 days. But it goes past the moon's orbit, which is this white circle here, into this virtual a Lagrange point, there's really nothing there, maybe not even space debris, because it's an unstable Lagrange point, but it goes with the Earth around the moon. And when you, this is the Earth, when you have the, the sun and the moon and the Earth behind the sun shield, the web will always be in the dark. And that's the whole point of getting this enormous infrared sensitivity. In that Lagrange point, and Wolf will talk more about it, it makes a sort of a Lissajou figure and a mathematical figure around this virtual point. And every two weeks you need to provide a little bit of propellant to keep it in that orbit. It's a very empty space. It's not like low earth orbit where there's an enormous number of satellites you can bump it. There's nothing else. So once it deploys, it moves the secondary mirror, which is the mirror that bounces the light from the primary into the instruments across its head in front, as you can see over here. And that has been tested many times on the ground. Um, and then there's two side panels, each containing three of these brilliant mirrors that move from backwards to in front. So that the telescope at that point is almost not quite in focus. Beryllium mirrors are about half the size of 
table. They're hexagonal. They're, they're made out of this very lightweight material that looks like aluminum, but it's, it's, it's much lighter and it does not expand and contract very much when you go from room temperature to 45 Kelvin. Here's the family portrait of all the hardware that has been made in the last 10, 10 15 years. The gold coated primary mirror is in the upper left. Uh, there's 18 of these segments of the poles. They sit together like a honeycomb. Secondary mirror, tertiary mirror, the secondary mirror is over here before it was gold coated. And then all these support structures and instrument packages and um, various other parts have been assembled. Um, like a big thing you build out of Lego, but a little more fancy over the last 50 and extensively tested in the last five years to make sure that the whole thing not only deploys, but also works. So very briefly, the light comes in from the left here, bounces off the primary, off the secondary, into this baffle, or we call it the doghouse, into this big uh, package that contains the instruments. Um, some more photographs of the various hardware um, are seen over here and on the next page. Um, I'll skip through that a little more quickly. Here you can see the mirrors as they were covered I asked specifically 15 years ago if we could have a cover on the mirrors in case we were staring at the ceiling for a couple of years in case the project was delayed and we didn't know like to do that, but eventually <laughs> they did it. I'm so glad we had them. How do you get these covers on these gold coated, very precise mirrors? Well, the next slide shows you uh, how we do that. We have two Olympic divers well, on diving boards, NASA technicians in clean room bunny suits that very carefully lift each cover on and off the mirror. So of course the, the telescope is now done and it was shipped without the covers, but we have protected it from um, dust and, and, and water and what have you not over the last decade. Uh, here you can see the telescope as it was finished on a merry-go-round in building 29 of Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland with the primary mirror uh, facing you the secondary mirror over its head here. The uh, NASA logo is on the wall here, the big ball. And in the next picture, you can see the whole team that's run by John uh, Matta, the Nobel laureate. Um, you can see the Na NASA logo on the wall is now behind you and you can see it in the mirror. Yeah, of course, it has been mirrored and it's magnified. So the logo is magnified by space telescopes. So it works. Um, this, of course, was not completely focused yet. That was something that came much later. Uh, we would actually uh, ship the telescope to a big container where it was tested for its proper operation. Before that happened, four instruments were mounted behind, behind uh, the telescope. There is the Canadian fine guiding sensor over here that holds the telescope still while it's locking onto two guide stars so it doesn't move during the exposure. And then there's the the infrared camera made by our colleague Marcia Ricci at the U of A, and then two European instruments, a mid infrared instrument over here, and then the mid infrared spectrum. And this entire package has now been shipped to 16 European countries in Canada and the US, of course, 27 states in the US that were involved in building this. I'll skip over some technical details. You may ask me the details uh, as we go here. You can see. The uh, secondary mirror being deployed, There's technicians running around. When that happens, you need to offload the weight of the mirror uh, so that <clears throat> the tiny motor that does this in zero gravity in space doesn't get uh, overloaded um, um, on the ground. And when we ship the telescope and the whole observatory with the spacecraft, everything else that comes with it, it doesn't fit in the overhead compartment. So it goes into this big container that goes on a, a, a 36 wheeler that takes two, two freeway lanes. And that's how it was shipped uh, via boat to French Guiana. Uh, for the sake of time, I'll leave it at this. Uh, I'll have a few more pictures later on that I will show to answer questions, which I'm sure you have many. I'll give it to either uh, who wants to go next, Rosalia, at least do. Liam will take it. Yeah. I think I'll take yeah. the next uh, yeah. piece. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Thank you so much for uh, all of that, Roger. And I think that on the same kind of topic of looking at things that are really deep in the universe, uh, I'm going to be talking a little about this image that many of you have probably seen before. It's called the uh, Hubble Ultra Deep Field, which is essentially looking at a portion of the sky, uh, which is about the size of your thumbnail, 
if you hold it out at arm's length, uh, that small, a small dark portion of the sky, the Hubble Space Telescope looked at for a very long period of time and was able to resolve all of these different brightly colored dots. And when you look at this image, you might be like, oh, there's a lot of stars in this image. Well, technically you're right, but these are uh, almost everything in this image is actually galaxies. These are collections of stars that are uh, as big or bigger or sometimes smaller than our Milky Way. And when you look at all these different pieces and you realize that it's such a small area of the sky, we realize that our universe is just filled with galaxies. And one of the big things with James Webb that we're gonna be able to do is look at a lot of these in much more detail. Now, some of the work that I've actually done here at ASU as an undergraduate has been working on this tool that I'm gonna show you called Appreciating Hubble at Hyperspeed or AHA. And you can actually download this tool if you want on our website, aha.asu.edu. But the power of this tool is we've rendered the Hubble Ultra Deep Field in 3D, where I can now click uh, on one of these galaxies and it's going to fly us right there. And you can really see all of these galaxies whizzing by us and it really gives you a cool idea of one, how far away these things are, but also how much detail we can see, because you can see these central regions, these outer areas where you've got all these stars spinning around, and I think all this is really neat. Now, part of what I've done here at ASU with this tool, uh, as I'll continue moving us from galaxy to galaxy, is uh, Roger actually invited me to work on uh, both this tool and the implementation of this tool in classrooms and things like that. Uh, and I designed a uh, study where we used this tool in one of Roger's classes um, in order to see how it affects the way different people learn and how people can retain astronomy concepts. Uh, this work that I did actually uh, ended up in a paper that I wrote, which was uh, accepted for publication uh, this past summer. And so I'll be uh, the author on a paper that we'll be able to publish soon, even as an undergraduate. And I think that's really neat and speaks to the different opportunities here at ASU. Something else that I've been working on for a fair period of time has been uh, looking at using a field that uh, Rolf actually developed uh, called the North Ecliptic Pole Time Domain Field. I've been looking at the properties of different galaxies in that field. Uh, and then I can actually turn us over to Rolf to maybe talk a little bit about that. Okay, thank you, Liam. So time domain science is a hot topic now. In the next decade, we have the Vera Ruman Observatory coming online with its LSST survey, and the Nancy Grace uh, Roman Space Telescope will also be launched and will survey the visible and near infrared sky for very faint objects that vary in brightness and uh, position with time, so they move. And that includes transitions like supernovae. So, this will enable time domain science in the solar system, in our galactic neighborhoods, and uh, at cosmological distances. But it begs the question uh, whether JWST can do time domain survey science, and if so, what would it add? So over similar time scales and in a suitable survey field, Webb can survey variable or moving objects that are at least three magnitudes fainter than LSST can. And this is an unexplored magnitude regime uh, for, for variability studies uh, for very faint supernovae of normal or exotic types. Uh, they would be visible to extremely large distances. And the same is true for faint and distant active galactic nuclei and uh, stars and substellar objects in our own galaxy. It's also an unexplored regime for detecting the motion uh, in the plane of the sky of very faint objects uh, in the extreme outer solar system and in our galactic neighborhood. And this might even include uh, the de detection of interstellar visitors or early detection thereof. Uh, such as Oumuamua or Common Borisov. Uh, next slide, please. But JWST has uh, several stringent operational restrictions. Uh, Roger mentioned that it, this telescope itself needs to be in the shade constantly. So the sun avoidance and the requirements for power generation and shielding, they restrict typically the object visibility to two time intervals per year, uh, except in two locations, in the North Ecliptic Pole and in the South Ecliptic Pole, where you can observe all the time. Next slide, please. With only plus or minus five degrees of nominal uh, roll angles, uh, as seen in the upper right uh, panel of this figure, 
the date of observation dictates the orientation of your instruments on the sky for any given target, except again in these two special locations, these continuous viewing zones. Next slide, please. So if we want to enable time domain science uh, with JWST on uh, timescales from minutes to over a decade, then we need a suitable survey field. And that survey field must be within these two special locations. And that unfortunately means that we cannot use the existing deep fields that were built by Hubble, like the one the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, or by Chandra or other missions. So let's take a near infrared look at the northern and southern continuous viewing zones. Uh, so these two pictures are two low resolution uh, composites constructed from two mass and wise images that cover much of the wavelength range of the uh, JWST's NERCAM uh, imager. And even by, by eye, the northern one at left looks much cleaner and emptier than the southern one at right, because the southern one contains the Large Magellanic Cloud. So it's great if you're interested in the Large Magellanic Cloud, but not if you want to look really, really far out into the universe. Next slide, please. Uh, also, in terms of galactic foreground extinction by interstellar dust, the northern CVZ at left has many more clear areas than the southern one at right. Uh, which again is dominated by the Large Magellanic Cloud and some galactic structures. Next slide. Uh, a suitable uh, field for time domain surveys uh, with JWST at any orientation must be circular, so we can rotate these instruments around the central point, and that gives a minimum diameter of about 14 arc minutes. Uh, that way we can use all three imaging instruments at the same time at any orientation and still allow for dithering and, uh, and buffering gaps between individual detectors. Uh, there's one problem though that JWST is so sensitive with its large aperture and sensitive detectors that even relatively faint objects can saturate the detectors. So we try to find a region that is free of anything that would deeply saturate these detectors. So a really empty region, really. Uh, next slide, please. So by looking at fields the size that we want, a 14 arc minutes diameter, and going through these two special regions in the sky, we try to find, OK, what are the most empty regions that contain no stars that deeply saturate the detectors? And it turns out that in the northern continuous viewing zone, there's a few areas. And one is particularly advantageous because it's quite large and really clean. Uh, in the south, that's not the case. We find really no suitable regions. Next slide, please. Uh, and the very best of the regions in the north that we found is what we call the James Webb Space Telescope North Ecliptic Pole Time Domain Field. Uh, because it's also very far away from the ecliptic, we also don't have to worry too much about the zodiacal foreground. It's the lowest we can get in the sky. Next slide, please. A bit fortuitous is that this field looks uh, out of the galaxy, but relatively close to the plane of the galaxy. It's about 33 degrees away. And even though it's very clean, we still have a fairly long sideline through our own galaxy. And that makes this field very suitable for galactic time domain science as well. Next slide, please. But to verify that this is really a, a field as good as a Hubble Ultra Deep Field, we uh, use the, the twin 8.4 meter or 27 feet large binocular telescope here in Arizona. It's the biggest uh, optical telescope in the world to see whether or not we saw any hint of something that would make this not a good field. And similarly, with the six and a half meter telescope, the MMT, also in Arizona, we looked in the near infrared whether that was still the case. And the good news is there's no bright red stars that could possibly saturate uh, the detectors during very deep extragalactic surveys. Next slide, please. And we also, uh, and that was led by uh, Roger Windhorst, uh, we got very, very deep VLA radio observations of this field. And uh, Liam actually worked on some of that data, as he mentioned. I think I've seen this. Yes, you've seen <laughs> this. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so while uh, the selection of this field and some of the verification took place right here at ASU and in Arizona, 
uh, a lot of people uh, got excited by this field and the community has been incredibly supportive in uh, covering this field across the electromagnetic spectrum from hard X-rays all the way to very long wave radio. Uh, next please. And this is just a snapshot of all the uh, different observations that have taken place in this field. And this is by uh, collaborators all over the world. Next slide. Roger Windhorst is going to devote a large chunk of his uh, GTO time as interdisciplinary scientist to uh, observe four spokes in this field, sort of get the first characterization of this field in the, uh, the near infrared at these very, very faint uh, brightnesses. And in parallel, we'll use the NERIS instrument to get slitless spectroscopy. And the nice thing is that if you rotate this particular pattern around, you can overlap the coverage of the spectroscopy with where you have already coverage in imaging in eight filters. And that means that we can, uh, in all likelihood, get for a very large number of objects, not just uh, a spectral energy distribution, how much light is being emitted at different wavelengths, but we also get their redshifts. We know how far away they are. Next slide, please. And another thing we did was to, to get uh, imaging at web resolution, but at wavelengths where web can actually not observe. And that's with the Hubble Space Telescope. And uh, we designed this, this, this rosette-like pattern uh, where we can use the, the, the least number of orbits to get to this same depth that the JWST will get to in uh, ultraviolet light and in two blue and green uh, light filters. And with that, I will pass it on to the next slide and to Rosalia. Hi. Um... <laughs> uh, yeah, so my, as a reminder, my name is Rosalia. Um, here at ASU, I'm a second year astrophysics grad student, and I'm currently participating in two projects. Um, the first I'm going to talk about is uh, what Rolf just talked about. So on the screen here, you can see some of our Hubble observations for this James Webb North Ecliptic Pole time domain field. So the Hubble observations here are indicated by these black and blue tiles. Um, and then the red outline shows where James Webb is going to see. Um, Liam, can you go to the next slide? Yep. If we zoom in a little, so this is a zoomed in version of pretty much what we just saw on the previous slide, you can see that we're going to see a lot of really interesting galaxies. Um, almost everything in this photo is a galaxy. Uh, there's about only like, I think, two stars in this photo. So we're going to be learning a lot about uh, galaxies, some interesting properties within galaxies. Um, what makes James Webb looking at this field really interesting is, first of all, uh, James Webb is going to be looking at redder photons. So these are going to be photons with a longer wavelength. Um, Hubble is optimized to look at bluer photons, so photons with a shorter wavelength. With James Webb, we're going to be able to look at these same galaxies that we already have with Hubble, but see the redder stars. So there's a bluer stars in these galaxies, but a lot of the mass in these galaxies is actually in the redder, longer living stars. Um, and we'll get a better idea of how these galaxies look um, from the redder filters on James Webb, which will be really exciting. Um, something else that I'm really excited about for James Webb is in the same image, we're going to actually be able to see farther back in time because James Webb is going to be looking at these redder filters. So um, that's pretty much because if you look, the farther away you look in space away from us, um, galaxies actually get redder. And that's because of the expansion of the universe. So when we look at James Webb in the same area you're seeing right now, we're going to see galaxies that are a lot farther away, um, probably hopefully the very first stars and galaxies that exist, existed in our universe. Um, and that will be very exciting. Um, yeah, is there anything else on this? Move on to Sky, sir. Great. Yep. Great. So can you pull up the Hubble deep field image? Yes, I can. I love this. One. Great. Yeah, so <laughs> this is a really popular image. Yeah, uh, Liam talked about it. Um, 
I think it was one of the first Hubble images we got where we could see as far back in time as we can in this image. So in this image, we're seeing almost the first stars and galaxies. Um, so some, probably some of the dimmest, smallest galaxies in this image um, are like 12 to 13 billion years. We're seeing they're like 12 to 13 billion years ago, um, which is very close to the beginning of the universe because we think the universe has been alive for about 13.8 billion years. And maybe if uh, for anyone who's not particularly familiar, um, part of what Rosalie is talking about here is that the uh, the light from different galaxies actually takes us takes a fair amount of time to reach us uh, here on Earth uh, or in very low orbit. Uh, and so what we often see when we look at things in the universe is we're going to be seeing galaxies that in much earlier in their history than we are in our history, because that light took the, uh, if they emit the light at a certain time. There's a certain speed of light, and so it'll take a certain amount of time for that light to reach us. Sorry yeah. To interrupt. No, yeah, that's good. Yeah, and yeah. So this image is amazing already. Um, my second project is actually called Sky Surf. This is probably going to be the project my dissertation's focused on. Um, and James Webb is still going to be really exciting for this other project. So if you look at this photo. Um, if you look at just the dark regions, um, so most people, when they take an image with Hubble, they want to look at stars or galaxies. Um, but the actual detector on Hubble is actually still getting photons in these darker regions uh, that look black, but really we're still getting photons in those areas. So we are still receiving light. Um, and I'm actually studying that light to try and better understand how much of it actually exists. This light is pretty much coming from galaxies that are so far away in this image that we can't really see them, but we're still getting their light because there's nothing to block the photons from eventually getting for our detector. Um, we just can't see an actual galaxy there. Um, so that's really cool. Um, James Webb, is not, since, like I said earlier, since James Webb is going to be able to see farther back in time, um, we're going to be able to see the galaxy that we can't see in this image because they're too far away. So we can get a better idea pretty much of the total amount of light in our entire universe. Um, depending on what we see with James Webb, it can tell us a lot about the early universe and how galaxies formed to make galaxies like our own Milky Way today. Um, I think that's the most exciting thing about James Webb for me. Um, so James Webb, He's going to look at a lot of things, um, going to look at red galaxies far back in the universe, but it'll also look at probably like exoplanets and stuff. But to me, the most exciting thing is going to be the possibility that we'll see the first galaxies. Um, and yeah, I feel really lucky to be here at ASU because I've gotten all these opportunities. I'm only a second year grad student, so I'm not even halfway done. But I'm st I've still gotten to participate in all this novel research. and. Yeah, I'm really excited for James Webb because of all the benefits it's going to have to what I'm studying now. Yeah. Well, I want you folks to realize that this young lady has been here for only a year, but she already processed more than 220,000 couple <laughs> images. So she does it very well and at the speed of light. Um, maybe, maybe Roger can give us a bit of a wrap up and then we'll move on to questions, I think, in just a, just a minute. Well, while we're looking at this image, I want you to realize that this image is no bigger than one tenth of the diameter of the full moon. So imagine you have a straw, not a regular straw, but one of these little red stir straws. You look at the sky, that's how much area you see here. And that area alone already contains between 10 and 20,000 galaxies. And James Webb is going to look further behind the first. Um, curtain of the first billion years where Hubble leaves off and where Webb, because of its infrared capability, will penetrate. We'll see these very early galaxies and stars. Um, should we answer some questions? I know there were quite a few and I already um, um, put a few answers in the chat, but we'd be happy to do Q&A here. Is this on? Yeah. Yeah, yeah there's a couple really good questions um, in the chat. I think. 
I don't know the answers to them. So I think, I think Kim's going to read it, pick a couple okay. and then they'll give it to us. Yeah. So uh, Matthew is asking, why are the mirrors hexagonal? So you want to mimic as large a mirror as you can, but you can't build a six and a half meter mirror out of such a thin layer of beryllium without it breaking. And so you make a smaller pieces that are strong enough and stiff enough um, that you can actually um, support them. And because they're hexagonal, you can have, as you can see in any of the pictures, you can make them all, almost touching each other, not quite, there's about a millimeter or two in between, but they're very close. And then there's a mechanism behind the mirrors that very cleverly steers them and puts them in place to compensate for the thermal distortions that's on chart 11. And you can see behind the beryllium mirror, this is sort of this hexagonal honeycomb structure um, that's supported with six, uh, what we call hexapods, fingers that push and pull it in exactly the right shape to within much smaller than the diameter of a human hair. So hexagonal, like a honeycomb, gives you the best way of using the same kind of pattern and fill a large area. Thank you for that in-depth answer. Um, Ryan would like to know, is there a set of uh, the first few, uh, for, excuse me, is there a set of a first few things that they are planning to use the telescope to see? And if so, why were those items chosen to be viewed first? Uh, so who, who will answer that one? Well, I mean, I think yeah. something that, yeah. you know, Rolf uh, talked about at length was one of the things that is going to be used during some of the guaranteed observing time that the group has is, is of course, the North Ecliptic Pole time domain field. Now, that's not a specific object, but we're going to be able to look at many, many objects in that field very in a very, what astronomers call a very deep way. So spending a lot of time looking in very high detail because you can collect a lot of photons, a lot of light hitting the detector. Um, and part of the reason, as we said, that was chosen is because you can look at it like any time of the year uh, without any kind of interference from other sorts of things around it. But there is also uh, a series of early, uh, uh, early release science projects that were competitively selected by, uh, from the whole community. Anyone who had a good idea could submit their proposal. And uh, those will be very, very high priority things to show the full range of capabilities that the James Webb Space Telescope has. Uh, so in many cases, it's both because it's so scientifically important and because they show how to use the telescope properly to the community. Aren't there at least one or two projects related to first light that are in that list? Uh, I'm sure there are. There, there's, yeah. uh, <laughs> Not our expertise, of course. <laughs> it, it, it covers the gamut all the way from, from the, the, the farthest reaches of the cosmos to what's going on with atmospheres of brown dwarfs or exoplanets. So um, we, we have these early release science, the ERS observations, and then our team observations and the community observations that come in the first year. So we leave in December. We have a month of journey, two months of deployment, and then three months of calibration before we take the first pictures. But the first pictures are called the EROs, the early release observations. And they are targets if you go to page 80, like we did for Hubble when a new instrument was just put on uh, by the astronauts. This is the UV image of a star cluster in the large Magellanic cloud, the ERO, ERO observation for Hubble in 2009. And we're not necessarily going to pick this target. I actually don't know what the targets are. They were held very closely on the lids by NASA. But they will be observed as soon as the telescope is fully deployed and calibrated, probably in May of next year. And then if you look at the infrared at the same region next chart, you see that in this, go toggle back to the previous one, you see this Christmas tree shaped thing in the, in, on the left, it's like a dark tree. And there's stars forming in that massive cloud of gas and dust. And if you go to the infrared version, you can see that in the infrared, you can poke through the dust, and the stars are better visible. And that's the environment where stars like the sun are forming. So this was one of our ERO observations 12 years ago, when we had launched the Hubble White Field Camera 3. And we'll have hopefully something much better and much more glorious when the web does its thing in late spring of next year. Yeah, so watch the New York Times front page, <laughs> just like this. Hopefully, they'll print it in call.
Yeah. <clears throat> Great answers. Thank yeah. you so much. Uh, Matthew was curious, what kind of testing for shock and vibration did you have to perform to prepare for w w JWST uh, for launch? So what did you have to do for that? Ah, so uh, if you go to chart, um, sorry about this, um, chart 46, um, this is a very special test environment in Northrop in building eight. And so they took the whole telescope and blanketed it up and put it on a shaking table where they do horizontal and vertical shaking to mimic um, what will happen during the launch in a few months. This was actually one of the most dangerous parts of the entire building of the telescope because they could not afford to have an earthquake during the you know, half day that it would take to move the telescope from one building to the other where the acoustic and the shake room was. And then once it was safely mounted on the table in the shake room, there was the, the El Monte earthquake in, in LA a few years ago, which was a Richter 4, so it wasn't too bad. They did sense the earthquake, it didn't do any damage. But um, anyway, so we, yeah, we've done a lot of testing and retesting to make sure that parts don't shake loose. And they found a few cases where something would need to be fixed. And that's why these tests take place. We want yeah. to know what can go wrong and how to fix it before we launch, not during launch. Exactly. <laughs> There's a very fun parallel if you've read The Martian, where when they send up one of these uh, rockets that are meant to resupply uh, the person stuck uh, on Mars, uh, spoiler alert, but there's some stuff that shakes and it goes very badly. <laughs> what a great comparison. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Professor Bose asked, can one do solar system science with JW JWST? And is anyone at CC slash ASU doing that? Uh -huh. Oh, you definitely can. Yes, oh, yes. <laughs> so we, we, early in the mission, we had to make sure that the telescope could not only point everywhere we wanted. Sometimes you have to wait for the sun not to be in the way, but also follow a moving target like Jupiter or Mars. They move fast in the sky. They're planets because that's the Greek word for wandering. They're not sitting still. And so we have moving target capability, and we're going to look for, you know, storms on Jupiter and, and uh, the atmospheric structure of Saturn and Jupiter and Saturn, and of course Mars, we will observe it with and without dust storms. And then of course, Pluto and its moons and other things that no longer are planets, we'll look at carefully. So yeah, there will be a lot of uh, planetary science um, with the James Webb Space Telescope. And there will be a lot of capabilities to look at the very, very outermost regions uh, of our solar system, like the Kuiper Belt, and maybe even what comes in from beyond. And then, of course, we're going to look for exoplanets around other stars as well, right? We're not satisfied with our solar system only. Um, this is chart 78 and following. So a bright star will be hard to see the planets surrounding it. But the Hubble, they succeeded a couple of times by very carefully subtracting the starlight in the left panel. And then, lo and behold, in the middle and right panel, uh, some stars were left, uh, three or four stars circled here. And this, we call this a coronagraph, the star subtraction technique. We're going to do much better with Webb. It has much higher resolution. And then the other neat trick is we're going to monitor a planet when it goes in front of its star. And of course, the star has a constant brightness, more or less. And when a planet goes in front, it's like a lunar eclipse. A tiny bit of light is taken out. And you produce a light curve of that total light. Here, this, this noisy curve on the right, it's actually not real noise, it's structure. You can see that. Um, for, from 100%, it dips down in a couple of hours, and then it goes down to 97%, and then a few hours later, it goes back up. And we call that uh, occulting exoplanets. And while the atmosphere of the planet is, this blue layer over here uh, goes across the star, you can actually see the, the light is dipping, not vertically, but slowly, uh, well, fairly quickly, actually, but within a short period of time. And during that time, you can take a spectrum of the star and derive what the chemical composition is present in the atmosphere of that planet. And a simulation of that, if you want to see some chemistry, now this gets a little technical, but this is an infrared spectrum, so the light as a functional wavelength uh, of what one of these uh, Earth-like exoplanets atmospheres would look like. And you can see there is indications of H2O, which is water, carbon dioxide, which is this little blip over here, and there's two more over here. And if you stare really hard, there's a feature in here somewhere that if this planet had life, which we don't know, 
but if it had ozone, which is produced by plants, then you could actually see the ozone feature as well. And so the, the jackpot here uh, would be kind of to see signatures for suitability for life. Great question. Yeah, so if you're excited about exoplanets, or maybe if you like aliens, I don't know, you should be very excited for James Webb. Um, she also asked who at ASU is doing exoplanet stuff. I know Michael Line does planet stuff. Yep. Who else? Sorry. I really should know because we do these problems in all of the <laughs> ASU undergrad courses, like literally this kind of data we do in the classes. So I know I've heard the names. I just don't know. We have well, a Professor Line does does the modeling of these kind of atmospheres, right? And Rolf's North Ecliptic Pole Field that Rosalie is also working on. Or all of you tell us how many brown dwarf stars do you expect there? Uh, I don't know off the top of my, off my head, but I think it's more than a few dozen. Yeah, it's, so it that's that's significant for just a single field. We don't have to hunt for them all over the yeah. sky. And, and with the windmill pattern that he indicated, you could monitor these stars almost as often as you want, mm -hmm. as long as the time allocation committee gives you time. And what you can do then, imagine Jupiter with the great red spot that goes around every 10 or 11 hours, I think, that spot. Is, is visible not, well, on Jupiter, of course, it is with a telescope. It, it is visible in the total, total light of that planet dipping up and down as a function of time, because it does make the planet a little darker when that spot is in front. And so we're going to hunt for great red spots on other planets like Jupiter. And, and, and that's what, what he is modeling. And so people like Michael Lang get very excited about this kind of monitoring we do because you can you know observe Jupiters in other solar systems as well. Yeah, ASU has a lot of exoplanet people, yeah. um, but we are not exoplanet people. <laughs> but you should still, if you're an exoplanet person, you should still be very excited for James Webb because there's going to be a lot of good science happening there. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Camille was wondering, how might our understanding of the age, shape, and expansion of the universe change due to this telescope? Um, I think one way, like I've probably said a lot of times already, is like I think it's really cool how far away we're going to be able to see from where we are now. So right now, probably the farthest away we've been able to see is with these Hubble Ultra Deep Field images. But James Webb is going to be able to see, um, like I said earlier, maybe the first stars and galaxies. Um, so first of all, we can look at those first stars and galaxies to get an idea of how fast they're expanding from us. Um, so that can give us a better understanding of the expansion of the universe, but also tell us a lot about what happened in the early universe, because these galaxies we're going to see really far away with James Webb um, kind of. Uh, related to what Liam said earlier, um, the farther back we look, or the farther through space we look, the galaxies get redder, but we're actually looking farther back in time. So we're going to see these galaxies as they were um, at the beginning of the universe. So that will really help us understand, maybe not as much about the universe itself, but about how galaxies evolve to be what we see maybe in our local universe today. And we also can get a really good idea of if, if we see what galaxies look like very early and when they're able to form in the universe, they probably have, they may have very different properties from the way they do today and the way that they've evolved to be today. Um, so that can give us a, an idea of what the conditions were in the very early universe, which is something we really know very little about in kind of the grand scheme of things. You know, we know a lot, but it's, you know, there's always a lot more to learn. There's also a very specific tracer that is being used to figure out what the expansion is. And those are uh, supernovae of a particular kind, supernovae 1A. And with the James Webb Space Telescope, we should be able to see these to at least a ratio of two and a half. And that's uh, almost two and a half times a uh, uh, larger redshift than Hubble typically can still reach for these objects. And that is a sort of a sweet spot where predictions for any weird kind of expansions or deviations from uh, linear expansion uh, should have the, the, the largest throw. We should be most sensitive to that in that redshift regime. So uh, that will be very, very exciting to see uh, how many supernovae 1A uh, we will get in fields that can be regularly monitored. Have, uh, have we said what 
redshift is. Uh, so yeah. not directly, so, maybe. So essentially, you know, just to, to kind of link together a lot of the points people have made, uh, in case you don't know, uh, when, as I talked about, light takes a certain amount of time to get to us here on Earth. And essentially what happens is, is that when light is actually passing through space, and as many of you probably know, the universe is expanding. And so as the space in between two different things expands, uh, you actually see that light gets stretched out as it travels. And astronomers can actually use the light from very different distant things uh, in or, and can determine based on how much that light has been stretched, you can figure out actually how long ago that light was emitted and or how far away these things are. So when we talk about redshift, we're really talking about a measure of distance, which also is effectively a measurement of time. I think a really great follow-up question that Ed has is how great of a redshift can James Webb uh, address usefully? So in principle, we have almost 20 times longer wavelengths than Hubble. Hubble stops at 1.6 microns. We can go to 30, 29 and a half, almost 20 times. But it doesn't mean you get 20 times further in distance. In principle, you could see 20 times further in redshift if the objects were there. We think they may actually not be there uh, until the first 200 million years had passed, which is about a redshift of 17. So that's what we hope for. Uh, Hubble's record is a redshift of 10 or 11. We can find dozens of papers in the literature on the same object because they can't agree uh, on, on what the true redshift is. And, and that's because it's the data is so uncertain. Hubble runs out of steam at that wavelength. Webb doesn't have that problem. So Webb will see dozens, and if you go back to the ultra deep field, um, the colorful picture, dozens of objects past redshift 10. So this is the ultraviolet optically rendered image all uh, 600 hours of data. The next is the infrared rendered, where we emphasize the infrared and the green and, and orange and red circles. You need to sort of get the original and magnify it. It's a very large image. It shows the galaxies within the first billion years. And there is dozens of them. But past the redshift of seven or eight, which is the first you know, maybe 700 million years, uh, Hubble just stops seeing many objects. There is just not much there. Uh, and that could be because Hubble doesn't have the sensitivity or because we just, you know, we really run out of galaxies and, and Webb will address that with its infrared uh, sensors. Great question. Thank you so much for that. And our last question of this evening is from Steve. And Steve said, I know that JWST will primarily be useful in infrared, but will it take any visible light images? Hmm. You want to answer that, Rolf? Yeah, I'll do this one. Yeah, or, 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 no. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, well, I'll say my answer and then you can say sure. your answer. Point seven. Um, yeah. So how telescopes work is you can use, so you can, there are many types of energies that a photon can have. Um, telescopes can usually only see, so energy corresponds to wavelength. So a shorter wavelength is a higher energy and a longer wavelength is a lower energy. Um, telescopes can only see like a certain range of energies of photons. Um, and James Webb is going to be looking at what's going to be it's one point something like uh, that. The, the shortest wavelength filter uh, is uh, around seven uh, seven of nanometers. So that's the oh. far far red is just too red for our eyes to see. Yeah. So that's gonna that means. Um, the wavelength of these photons that James Webb is going to see, um, the highest energy that we're going to be able to see is about 0.7 nanometers is how big those photons are going to be. So that's really small. Um, yeah, and as Rolf said, that... Yeah, so the <laughs> shortest wavelength is something that your eye can just barely see, far red, right? 0.7 microns, and, and that's it. So there's... If you looked, if, if you were launched with the telescope and sat behind the, the mirrors and you were looking, you'd only see a very narrow wavelength range. And that's not the fault of James Webb. That's the fault of your eyes. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not a good telescope to look through. Hubble, on the other hand. But it's also the reason that the mirror is gold coated, it's because gold reflects really, really well these long wavelength photons. 
whereas most optical telescopes are coated with either silver or aluminum. Uh, and those mirrors, they look much bluer in a sense. Uh, they reflect bluer visible photons much better. I always find it really funny when I see certain telescopes that are not meant to look in the optical and they're just completely opaque to the, to the eye. Uh, and you think, oh, nothing gets through that, but then it's actually completely translucent or transparent to, uh, to the photons that are of interest. I'm answering some more questions by typing them. <laughs> I don't know, I'd be happy to answer more questions or take more questions. But I know there will be a class in here in half an hour or so. <laughs> Okay, well, I'd like to, first of all, thank Roger, Ralph, Rosalia, and Liam for a wonderful presentation this evening. And thank you to our audience for joining us. And also thank you to Roger and Ralph for sharing all your knowledge and insights about the James Webb Space Telescope. And thank you again for being our New Discoveries Lecture presenters this evening. And thank you to everyone who attended tonight's lecture. I hope you'll join us in the spring when we resume our New Discoveries Lecture series and showcase our current research. The Wi-Fi went out. Oh, is that, that is funny timing. <laughs> we lost every. Well, actually, yes. I still see. I can actually. Everyone is out of the room except me and Meg <laughs> and ASC and like the main oh, thing. Oh, I'm still oh. here. Oh, you better believe I'm still here. <laughs>